on behalf of the Dickey Center's director, Tori Holt, my colleague, Professor of Virginia, I want to thank all of you for being here. And I want to thank also, I'm about to introduce, um, we will have an opening remarks uh, from Consul General Roger Kuzner of, the, of Canada, uh, from the, the consulate in Boston of Canada. And he is, named, he is was first elected to the House of Commons in November 2000 as a member of parliament for uh, Bras d'Or, Cape Breton. And he was re-elected in five subsequent elections before his recent retirement in, uh, but that's, that's in October 2019. Um, he spent a lot of time in Ottawa in government. He has been, I've only met him recently with, uh, through some work with our US Canada at the Dickey Center um, when he was appointed and we were so honored to have Zooms with him. Thank you so much for taking Zooms with us for us to talk about the US Canada relationships between Dartmouth, the Dickey Center, the Institute of Arctic Studies and other programs all over campus that the, the, uh, the consulate in Boston has always been very attentive to, thoughtful to and supportive of. And so it's a great honor that we have Consul Gen General Roger Kuzner here to open these remarks and make some uh, very important remembrances of what this day is currently for Canada. So thank you, Consul General, and we invite you up. Professor Perkins, thanks so much for the uh, kind introduction. Um, good afternoon, and uh, I am absolutely pleased to be here at Dartmouth College. Uh, it's my first uh, uh, time on the campus. Uh, I find it really cool that uh, there aren't a whole lot of uh, campuses that you come to and you see an Anukshuk uh, centerpiece uh, in front of one of the buildings, so uh, that uh, uh, it had a, a sense of familiarity for myself. Um, and, and thanks uh, to the Professor Birkins and Holt. Um, and uh, of course, uh, being here today as a fellow Nova Scotian, uh, that's, that's always good, a little bit of home cooking here. Um, I'd like to acknowledge today's event is taking place on the traditional lands of the Abenaki uh, as well as the Algonquin peoples. Uh, such an acknowledgement is particularly important today uh, in Canada. It's the first national day of truth and reconciliation, the national day uh, where the, it's a new federal day of commemoration to honor the lost children and survivors of residential schools, uh, their families and communities, and to ensure that public commemoration of the history and ongoing impacts of residential schools remains a vital component of the reconciliation process. The date of September 30th builds on the grassroots momentum of Orange Shirt Day, which is already known as a day to remember the legacy of res residential schools because of the work of activists and indigenous leaders. Residential schools were part of the colonial assimilationist policies that removed indigenous children from their communities and families. The National Day of Truth and Reconciliation is an opportunity for Canadians to learn about the lasting negative impacts residential schools have left on generations of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. The National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is an opportunity for all Canadians to recognize and reflect on the legacy of the residential schools. Everyone in Canada has a role to play in learning about and addressing the legacy of residential schools, the impact on the survivors, and of the many children who did not return. We hope that the mistakes of past generations will provide opportunities for future generations. The path forward to reconciliation is about building and understanding, repairing relationships and moving toward healing. And to do so, we have a responsibility to learn about the past and how we got here, to share this knowledge with others and join with Indigenous peoples as caring partners to offer support in moving forward together. The mistreatment of Indigenous children at residential schools is a tragedy whose impact is still felt today. There were 140 federally run Indian residential schools which operated in Canada between 1831 and as late as 1998. The last one was closed 23 years ago. 
while most Canadians have only recently become aware of the impacts of the residential schools uh, and of the many children who have not returned, these uh, are truths of the First Nation, First Nations. We must never forget those innocent children who were lost due to colonial policies, and this must be our collective commitment towards reconciliation. In closing, Professor Gonick, uh, her research and her presentation are poignant today on this somber day of reflection and commemoration. Her work on young Indigenous women's experiences of sexualized violence is timely and another important reminder of the tragedies which First Nation communities have faced throughout Canada's history. Her work is part of the national collaboration working with Indigenous communities and research partners from coast to coast to coast, and I am proud to be here today to listen to her presentation. Thank you again to the Dickey Center for the invitation to be here, and thank you, Professor, for your presentation here today. Oh, my thanks, uh, very important. Um, th thank you so much to be here on this day as well um, and, and to commemorate that with us. Um, so on behalf, again, of the Dickey Center and the Institute for Arctic Studies, uh, I wanted to make a formal introduction of Dr. Marnina Gonick. Um, we are so honored to have you here and uh, to bring folks here to hear you. Um, we are also live streaming, so just so you know, this is going out and will be posted. So we're really excited, even in, in this time, we can actually share this knowledge with many other communities who might not be able to be here. Um, Marnina Gonick is a professor of education and women's studies at Mount St. Vincent University. She is, of course, a key part of our U.S.-Canada partnership as the 2020-2021 Fulbright Canada Visiting Chair in Arctic Studies at Dartmouth. She is actually the fifth in a distinguished series of our Canadian visitors with that title once it was first launched in 2017. And each scholar is brought here with the generous support of both Canada Fulbright as well as the Dartmouth uh, Dean of Faculty's office as they pursue their individual and meaningful research in Arctic studies and become part of our small community here in the Upper Valley, but hopefully having lifelong connections between our campus and your own com Canadian communities and ideas. Each scholar helps us deepen and broaden those connections. We are also honored to have your specific area of research, a unique, timely, and important part of, of this, uh, these studies. And her focus more broadly is on girlhood studies, gender, education, and youth cultures, and has been recognized both nationally and internationally for that work. She has, uh, before, at Mount St. University, uh, Mount St. Vincent University, she held the Canada Research Chair in Gender after teaching at Pennsylvania State University in the Faculty of Education and the Department of Women's Studies. She has been an invited guest speaker at Canadian universities, including McGill, York, and the University of Ottawa. And she has been an invited guest speaker at international conferences, most recently in Finland, the United Kingdom, and in Australia. Her Fulbright scholarship here at Dartmouth, as you'll hear, focuses on community-engaged research with Indigenous communities throughout Canada on issues of gender and sexual violence. Welcome, Marnina. We can't wait to hear from you. We are so honored to have you and all the connections you bring to us here at Dartmouth. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, and greetings to those of you who are joining us online. I also want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, uh, thank you to my fellow Canadians for coming and joining us today um, and doing the land acknowledgement. Um, so since you have already done the land acknowledgement uh, for this territory, the Abenaki territory, I will do a land acknowledgement for the territory that I come from, uh, where I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It's known as Kabukchuk by the Mi'kmaq people, whose unceded territory includes the provinces of Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and parts of New Brunswick. Um, as was already mentioned, today we're commemorating the uh, Day of uh, Truth and Reconciliation, formerly known as Orange T-Shirt Day, and as you can see, I'm uh, carrying on a tradition of, uh, of the Orange T-Shirt Day and just drawing your attention to the symbol of the, of the day, which is uh, Every Child Matters, um, marking the uh, tragedies of the residential school system and honoring the survivors. Um, 
So my second way of starting this presentation today is with a bit of a confession. And that is my route to Arctic studies is quite a circuitous one. I'm predominantly a youth researcher trained in a department of sociology and equity studies and education. And I became interested in Inuit girls in the Arctic at a time when the field of education had more or less abandoned girls, uh, mainly discursively, not literally abandoned girls, in the mid 2000s, when there was a sense that girls' success in, you know, in testing scores, um, in gaining admission to universities, that they were outperforming boys. And that at that point, there was a debate and lots of discussion in the, in the media and within education circles about the need to redistribute resources to boys. Despite the reverse trend, in other words, girls uh, you know, not performing as well as tests, on tests and not getting into universities in the same, uh, you know, in the same way as young men, um, despite the reverse trend having been in effect for all prior historical periods. At that time, there was a very strong and pervasive discourse of girl power, some of you might remember that, in the media and within the field of education, as if all girls could gain access to the pathways to success as defined by neoliberal governmentality, like the most privileged girls in the country. So my own research has always been focused on marginalized communities, immigrant and refugee young people in inner city schools, LGBTQ youth, and women and girls living with disabilities. So I undertook a project working in four communities and regions across Canada to respond to this notion of girl power and how it really eclipsed the possibility of addressing the ongoing issues facing girls within schools. For this project, I worked with a professional filmmaker who was my brother, Noam Gonick, um, based out of Winnipeg, Manitoba. And one of the communities that we visited and worked with was in Kalukduk, Nunavut. So that was my introduction to Arctic research. My brother and I produced a video installation called Voices in Longitude and Latitude, um, which was, when installed in an art gallery setting, looks like this. Um, so it's four screens, two ginormous screens suspended from the ceiling and then two smaller screens on the uh, side. Um, the, the finished video intermingles and intersperses the girls' voices from the four communities. The four communities we looked at were, uh, that we worked in were Kalukduk in, in, in Nunavut, Winnipeg, which is our hometown, Halifax, which is where I live now, and Toronto. But we also made a short video of just the Inuit girls and that short, shorter video, video is what I'm going to show you today, or one of the pieces I'm going to show you today. The second project I'm going to talk about today is called Networks for Change and Wellbeing, Girl-Led from the Ground Up Policymaking to Address Sexual Violence in Canada and South Africa. And this is an international collaboration working with Indigenous communities in South Africa and in Canada. And the community I work in with this project is in Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. And the project uses participatory arts research methodologies, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I've been working in the North since 2014, visiting as often as possible, which recently hasn't been possible at all due to COVID. As a non-Indigenous researcher, my projects are done in collaboration with the local community. So in Kalukduk, I work with the high school there, and in Rankin Inlet, I work with the Rankin Inlet Spousal Abuse Center. And I'm happy to discuss further, maybe in the question and answer period, uh, some of the principles I use or some of the complications that exist as a non-Indigenous researcher working in Indigenous communities. So I'm happy to, if that comes up in the discussion, to um, um, hear your thoughts on it as well as answer your questions. So since some of you are here, I'm assuming, may not know that much about none of it, I'm going to give you some basic background about the region before I talk about the projects there. <coughs> um, so first of all, this is where it is. This is the communities. Um, there's, uh, so it came into being in 1999, so it's a relatively young, uh, you know, young in terms of recognized as, uh, 
as, um, as a kind of territory. Um, it's, so 1999, it's a, res it's a result of the largest indigenous land claim in history, with Inuit ga gaining title to 355,842 kilometers of land, in addition to the creation of Nunavut, which is approximately 2 million square kilometers as a political entity. Significant government involvement in the lives of the Inuit began officially in 1957. So again, really not that long ago, um, if you think about you know, um, the way social change uh, happens, which included the presence of the military and large-scale family relocations. Inuit were, removed, were moved from their extended family camps on the land where they had lived for many centuries to aggregated settlements. The government era changed northern life enormously, as did mandatory schooling, which often involved missionary residential schools where much sexual, emotional, and physical abuse took place. So that's what we're marking today with the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Day. The era, this era has produced the most rapid and extreme social change in Inuit history. Many aspects <coughs> of life were radically altered. Communities modified their diet, so previously they were subsist subsistence hunters. Um, now hunting has decreased. And social arrangements change from extended family groups and semi-nomadic hunting practices to a modern wage economy. After generations of self-sufficiency, Inuit communities have become embedded in the global economy. The fur trade industry collapsed in the early 1980s, devastating many Inuit communities and poverty has become commonplace. So there's currently 27 communities in Nunavut here that you can see them on this map, <coughs> ranging in population from less than 500 to the capital Iqaluit, which is on the right-hand side in the middle, you can see. Uh, yeah, the right should be uh, just at the end of the map there, um, with a population of almost 7,000. Um, so just also to give you a sense of where none of it is in relation to the rest of Canada, here's another map for you. And you, this is the map of Canada, and you can see none of it at the very top. Most Canadians... <laughs> we're here <laughs> at the border with the United States. So you can see just how far away none of it is from, and how many Canadians, um, you know, it, it's so far away, not just geographically and physically, but also from the experience of, um, of other Canadians. So given the history and the context that I've just uh, told you about, there are a lot of social issues uh, facing Indigenous youth, Inuit youth, and none of it. And although I don't, this isn't the story I want to tell today, I do feel like I have to give you some of the background in order for you to understand the, the project that I'm working on. Um, so here's just some of the, oh, okay, here's a picture of Kolokduk in the winter. This is one of the communities I work in. And here's a picture of Rankin Inlet in the summer. Um, so you can see a much bigger, uh, a much bigger place with lots of vehicles that's relatively recent. So on to this idea of what are some of the social issues um, young people encounter in the North. The population of, of Nunavut is extremely young. So 60% of the population are younger than 25. So that's, ra again, radically different than the rest of Canada, which is an aging population. The birth rate is twice that of other regions of Canada. And the social distress experienced by Indigenous peoples following imperialism, colonialism, and climate change has been well documented and includes issues such as an epidemic of suicide, particularly uh, amongst young people, early pregnancy, infant mortality rates that are 3.5% higher than the rest of the country, and a life expectancy that's 12 years lower. That's coming from Statistics Canada. There's also issues of substance abuse, lower educational attainment, high unemployment rates, scarcity of housing, food insecurity, and high rates of sexual and gender-based violence. So a lot of these issues have been well documented, I, as I said, in research. And um, there's also been a recent national inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, 
which also documents this, uh, these phenomenon. Um, in that study, Indigenous women were found to be three times more likely to experience violence than non-Indigenous women, and the forms of violence were more likely to be severe and life-threatening. Indigenous women continue to face high rates of sexual assault and abuse. They are eight times more likely than non-Indigenous women to be killed by an intimate partner. And, uh, by an intimate partner. And it is clear that the legacy of residential schools, foster care system, and colonialism are directly linked to this, these phenomenon. So while there are many, many serious social problems in the North, as a non-Indigenous researcher, uh, my aim in my projects is not to go in with solutions to these problems. The approach I use, sometimes called participatory action research, which in very simple terms, attempts to create spaces for community expertise and community design solutions. I've been influenced by indigenous researchers such as Eve Tuck and Gerald Vishnor, who argue for a strength-based approach to research in indigenous communities. Eve Tuck, for example, um, cautions against what she calls damage-centered research and suggests instead desire-based research as an alternative in her important and more relevant than ever 2009 article in the Harvard Educational Review. She, ca she cautions against a pathologizing approach in which the oppression singularly defines the community. So it would be very easy in these, in, in these two communities that I work to only focus on all the things that are terribly, terribly wrong in the lives of indigenous young people and, and particularly indig indigenous girls in these communities. But she says, Eve Tuck says, that a damage approach is based on a theory of change that establishes harm or injury in order to achieve reparation. <coughs> she says that as researchers, we have to be aware of what theories of change are driving our research, what is underlying our research in terms of what, you know, even if we don't maybe purposefully or clearly articulate at, at what our theory of change is, because often we are working on, you know, kind of ass assumptions about how social change happens. But she's arguing for us to become more aware of what our theories of change are um, to help operationalize the ethical stance of the project, to help us understand what are considered data in the project, what constitutes evidence, how a finding is identified, and what is made public and kept private or sacred. So as I said before, she is suggesting a desire-based framework. And what that is, she says, is to document not only the painful elements of social realities, but also the wisdom and hope. As I said, I also draw on Gerald Weissner's uh, work. And he has this really interesting and important concept called survivance. Um, and by this, he means a native sense of presence the notion of sovereignty, and the will to resist dominance. Survivance is not just survival, but also resistance, not heroic or tragic. The tease of tradition and my sense of survivance outwit outwits dominance and victimry. So again, going beyond the kind of easy story that could be told about uh, in life in indigenous communities for young people. So to show you what I've been thinking about, about how to actually operationalize these ideas um, about a um, moving away from a damage approach and operationalizing what survivance might entail in terms of a research project. I'm going to show you um, the first video clip. This is the Inuit material from Kaluktuk, the voices video. And um, you're going to have to imagine the four screens. You're going to see four squares instead. It's going to look, you know, much flatter than it was uh, designed to. Um, and let's hope that I can get this to work. <laughs> okay, yeah, now I remember what they said. Okay.
Hi, my name is Caitlin Bangun. I'm from Kogwaksa from 18, gonna be 19 next Thursday. My name is Shanda and I'm 17 and I live in Kogwaktok, Nanoi. Hi, I'm Jules from Kogwaktok. I'm Barbara Kabratwak. I live in Kogwaktok, Nunavut and I'm 19 years old. to go to NS, upgrade my schooling and then take a take culinary arts and at Nate and Edmonton. To do. For, at first I wanted I to be an electrician and then I wanted to be a power system electrician. And Seeing then my sister pursue her dreams and work. watching her with her children and providing for them and making a living for her kids and working very hard just for her kids makes me want to be like her. I went back to and school this my year for my daughter so she could have a better life than a better life than what her dad is giving her. There's this legend about my great 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 uncle Elitia. He he was known as a shaman. My late grandma, she was a well-known storyteller and a seamstress. We named our daughter after my deceased mother-in-law. She fell through the ice, and her so did her husband, but her husband survived. A good shaman. He helped people when they were sick and when they got wounded. It took him six hours to come here and he crawled all the way. My husband taught her kids also how to hunt, how to live, how to survive. My dad, he did a carving of him. He called it Elitdeak, the man who could fly. Young girls are getting pregnant at a young age and becoming mothers at a young age. And like most of, like, I guess most, or maybe half of the women in this town are, they don't have an education because of becoming parents early. I do want to get married sometime in the future, maybe when I'm 50. <laughs> And it's too old. I'm not too sure about kids yet. I dream to have kids one day. Just not now. I need a life of my own first. I'm going to smarten up my daughter's pregnant. It takes experience being a young adult, not, not rushing to being a mother. Because being a mother is a handful. She's 14 and a half months old. I love her so much. I had her in December 08. And she's my whole world. I know what I would do without her now as a dad. I 
think it was a mistake having her because I'm stuck in a relationship I don't want to be in. And I was only like 14 years old when I started going out with him. And he's eight years older than me, so. I think I might work somewhere else for a while other than here in Kolaktok. I could live I could live in Paris if I wanted to. I wanna go to Paris and Kolaktok's not the only place on this world. I not too sure when I wanna come back. For me I wouldn't mind coming back because I like this place. But when I get my degree, I want to move to a city. Same time, I want to stay here. I want to go far beyond Kolokto. If I was given the opportunity to, I'd take it. I've been wanting this guy, we've both been wanting each other. I always think of him every day, I'm not with my boyfriend. I wrote him a letter on Facebook that I still have feelings for him and when I do leave my boyfriend, I would go and be with him. And I had a dream last night that he told me he loved me. Okay, so I'm happy to come back and talk about this video at the question time. Um, but now I'm going to move on to, it's always hard to move on from that video, I find, even though I've seen it so many times. Um, <coughs> it's still kind of um, an emotional for me to be listening and, and seeing those girls again. Um, so, but moving on to the second project. Um, I want to talk to you about today. It's the um, Networks for Change and Wellbeing, the South Africa Canada collaboration. And this project is um, gui guided by these <coughs> five research questions, which I'll read because I'm not sure how well you can see them. Um, so this, these questions are, uh, how might arts-based activities support Inuit girls in understanding, combating, and leading in community change? What is the role of adults in work that seeks to be youth-led? How might community involvement in such a project be enacted? What are the most effective ways to use arts-based activities to communicate about social issues? And in what ways can an intergenerational approach be useful for supporting community change? So just to give you a little bit of information about what we've been doing in Rankin, um, I, I work with an Inuit collaborator there and we've been running week-long workshops with very small groups of girls, ages 11 to 15 approximately, uh, where we uh, engage them in, in art-making activities such as photo voice, cell films, and digital narratives. Working together, the girls create a, a variety of creative projects that take up issues that they identify as relevant to their lives and their community. We also provide opportunities for the groups to learn about their own cultural traditions and understandings of ways in which the issue might be addressed by working with elders in the community and having them share with the young women their stories and experiences. In this way, we try to practice a strength-based approach to link young women to the cultural traditions of their own communities. Um, we end each workshop with a community event, often involving food of some kind, um, where the girls present their work to the community, it's mainly their parents uh, and extended families. Sometimes other community members uh, join as well. 
And then we have an intergenerational exchange about the issues that are presented in the artworks. So um, the rationale, so why use an arts-based uh, research method? Um, in the work, we argue that arts-based approaches are a pathway to supporting Inuit young people as knowers, as actors, and as community leaders in tackling the social issues structuring their lives and ensuring that they have the tools to allow them to speak and speak back on the issues as they see them. Digital methods such as participatory video are examples of participant-centered, youth-focused research methods that have been used successfully across a wide range of academic disciplines and geographic regions. So just in my own case, as I mentioned, we've used this in the north, um, in South Africa, and I also have another project in Vietnam where we also use these methods with um, women and girls with disabilities. In northern Canada, digital media, particularly film, have long been used in research and to share Inuit life and culture with broad audiences. And youth-led filmmaking is also well established in the north with groups such as the Aravat Film Society, Conversations with the Earth, and Connacht Productions leading the way for digital communications. So in other words, I kind of, I mentioned this to indicate that we're not as researchers bringing in technologies and methods that are not, are, that the Inuit are not already familiar with. An often undervalued benefit of using participatory visual methods to work with young people is that these methods are often fun and engaging. And as you'll see in a minute, the girls have a lot of fun um, doing this. Barley and Russell observed that Participatory visual methods can capture meaningful youth-centered and youth-generated perspectives of their everyday lives in situ. And James, Jenks, and Prout suggest that working with children using participatory methods it is, is a recognition of the paradigm shift in the conceptualization of children in childhood, which recognizes children as active, knowledgeable social agents and as able to contribute to the co-construction of knowledge. I have found often in some of my other work with, young, with youth and young children that often, you know, in traditional research methods, we expect or we rely on our participants to be able to um, reflect on their exper experiences verbally, like in an interview and so on. But with young people, if you, if you ask them a question, you know, tell me about some, you know, whatever it is, you're not going to get a fully formed, uh, beautiful answer. So the using visual methods is an opportunity for reflection that isn't dependent on the verbal. So young people um, can use these methods um, and you can you know, generate some interesting material to work with as a researcher. So cell films, I'm sure the term is self-explanatory, but what is it? It's a short film created by re researcher participants on a cell phone or a tablet in response to a prompt. So a prompt could be something like, um, you know, what is an important issue that Inuit girls deal with? So something like that. Then what we would do is generate a list of all the themes that the girls in the group uh, think, you know, uh, are interested in or that, that comes to mind. Then we do what I call a dotocracy, which is everybody gets a sheet of uh, stickers, little dot stickers, and the girls each take a sheet and they uh, put dots on the themes that they're interested in working on. And then what we do is we just count up the dots at the end and the themes that get the most dots <laughs> are the ones that we uh, work on and we d design uh, re um, you know, art projects around. For the videos, for the cell films, we, each of the groups works on a storyboard so they, it's a very simple, it's like a four square storyboard where they plan out you know, location, where are they going to do the shooting? What, what's going to happen in the, in the scene? How many scenes are there going to be? How many actors do you need for the, for the, um, uh, for the story? And, you know, some, some films are more documentary, some are more fictional, acting out. Um, so there's a lot of different genres that you can do with cell films. The girls um, film, direct, act, and edit uh, the material themselves with, with support. Um, so, I'm going to show you an example of uh, one of these cell phones that was made in a group uh, in, from Rankin Inlet. It's called The Price is Too High, and it is a very kid-made 
uh, film, you'll see, <laughs> you'll see the difference, hopefully, between that one and the uh, one I made. Um, <laughs> maybe not. Um, and uh, the, the theme of the video is about the, the high cost of, of food in the North. And this has been a feature of media stories for quite a long time in Canada, how incredibly expensive it is to buy groceries in the North and how, as a result, there's major food insecurity problems in these communities. So the girls decided that they would compare the prices in the two grocery stores in Rankin. So one is the co-op, one is the northern. And as part of the workshop, we invited an elder to teach uh, throat singing, which is a traditional Inuit um, style of singing, mainly by women. In fact, I think it's only exclusively women. And um, as part of the intergenerational connection building. So you'll hear some throat singing in the video. And the two girls who are doing the throat singing were um, very skilled throat singers before, we, before the workshop. So it's, it's a quite a complicated technique. Um, so they didn't just learn it in the, um, in the workshop. <clears throat> okay, so back here. Here we go, voice is too high, uh, the price is too high. Oh, there it is. Thank you. 
sweet bell peppers in it, eight dollars and thirty-five cents. These are corns from the pot, and these are eight ninety-nine. I mean, eight eighty-nine from Northern Star. This flower and it's thirty-one seventy-five from Northern. This is sugar and it's fourteen seventy-nine. Okay, so I'm just going to make some concluding comments about the kind of research I do in general. <coughs> so considering the, um, whoops, I got to make this big. <coughs> considering the dynamic social, cultural, political, and economic landscape in the North, the involvement of Inuit communities in research is critical. This highlights local knowledge, voices, and experience in shaping the arts-based activities and in working in culturally appropriate ways with the youth and other community members. Research has shown that the opportunity to be meaningfully involved in the community is one of the many factors known to enhance health and well-being of young people in the North. Having nothing to do is one of the refrains from the girls I worked with in both Rankin Inlet and Kalukuk. As one participant said, I think it's really good to have something to do because when there's nothing to do, you end up doing bad stuff. And another echoed the sentiment, there's not much for you here, it's kind of depressing. Other identified factors for enhancing health and well-being include community connectedness, communication and interaction, connecting generations, a sense of purpose, community pride and cultural traditions and practices. These factors are linked to changes in the family and are therefore an important element for understanding some of the challenges Inuit youth encounter today. My research indicates that many Inuit youth feel increasingly alone with experiences of a global society that diverge from the life experiences of their parents and elders. <coughs> Inuit youth are motivated to be part of this global economy and to also feel connected to the world of traditional values and practices represented by their elders. Many Inuit youth say they live in these two worlds, yet feel they are deeply rooted in neither. As a participant from Rankin Inlet noted, nowadays we don't visit our relatives, our elder uncles, older aunties, and stuff like that anymore. Maybe it's because there's so many people here now, but the times have changed a lot, and we are now in a place where we don't really know the traditional ways, but we don't always know the new way either. Intergenerational segregation is increasingly a common feature of community life in the North, and it appears that feelings of not belonging together, together with emotional disconnection, are contributing to social distress among Inuit youth. There's clearly uh, no one initiative or set of interventions that can be regarded as the singular answer to addressing the many social issues facing Inuit girls and women. However, the arts-based activities of these projects 
and the community dialogues that ensue are designed to contribute to community, communication, and interaction, connecting generations, and a sense of purpose, community pride, and cultural traditions and practices. And these ideas are also found in a, in a range of documents that I just want to give you the uh, names of, again, in case you're interested in following up. Um, these factors are linked to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that's right, the calls to action, the 93 calls of action that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the report from the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. It's highlighted in other reports, such as the UN study, Breaking the Silence on Violence Against Indigenous Girls, Adolescents, and Young Women, and earlier studies, such as Amnesty International's Stolen Sisters, Discrimination and Violence Against Indigenous Women in, in Canada and Child and Collaborators 2004 study, Keeping the Promise, the Conventions on the Rights of the Child of First Nations Children and Youth. So the issues are complex and they cross generations. And um, here's a list of, or a few sample, if anyone wants to follow up, of um, some publications that I have coming out of these two projects, if you want to uh, look at them further. And just end by saying thank you, Walalin, and Merci. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering how connected through social media these kids are. Are they, they have cell phones or they get, mostly get their um, connectivity through television or laptops or, you know, I just wonder what the technology is that they're using yeah, or connecting with. Yeah, that's a great question. Mainly they are very connected. Um, like for example, when we talked about what music to have in the video, they knew all the top hits and the pop, you know, popular radio, they, they knew all that music. Um, they don't necessarily have their own cell phones, but somebody in their family has a cell phone. Um, they don't, most of them wouldn't have a computer at home, but they would have access to a computer at school. Um, so, you know, so they, they're certainly accessed, maybe not as extensive as kids in the South, South would have, but they're, they're certainly well aware of what's out there. And, t and television, all the houses, if you saw the video, have these huge um, satellite dishes. So there's a lot of TV access. Thank you so much for this. Uh, I had a question. How did you connect with both the women who were in the video and the young women in the courts? How did you uh, put that group, those groups together? Yeah, I relied on my community partners. Um, so for the first video in Kaluktuk, um, it was the school. I worked with the high school. And we did, uh, we, uh, in, in consultation with the school, we did a little uh, video making workshop for the girls who wanted to participate. And then they, you know, they also participated in our video. And um, these were girls who were trying to get enough high school credits to graduate. And so the high school principal agreed, or he, it was his idea, that they could get high school credit if they participated in the workshop and in the video making process. So that's how that happened. And the other group, uh, the rank of the younger girls in Rankin Inlet, I worked with the Rankin Inlet Spousal Abuse Center, and they, um, it's a very, the Rankin Inlet is an incredible community, very community oriented. So there's a, a lot of, there's like a Rankin Inlet Facebook page, for example. So it's really not hard <laughs> getting the word out. And so we, um, we, we also work from year to year with some of the same girls, because we're, we're trying to build, um, you know, enduring relationships with them. And we'll, eventually what we're hoping to do is have a group of younger girls join the older girls and have the older girls mentoring the younger ones uh, in the community. So we, it's through the Spousal Abuse Center that we recruit, or not recruit, but like engage, engage the girls to participate.
Um, so my question actually follows that too is, um, and you're hitting you know, how, how uh, to engage um, respectfully and meaningfully in research in communities. And one of the questions is you had community partners. Were you able to, does Canada have a system so that you can actually, or do, does your, your university have a system where you can actually get some seed funds early on to make those connections before the research starts? Because that's always one of the challenges we know in some of the US research systems is they kind of expect you to write the grant like it's already happening. But to make these connections, you sometimes need the support and support to the community, some payments to community to make actually these connections. Yeah, that is, uh, it is an ongoing issue, especially for people wanting to do research with Indigenous communities, because you can't just walk into an Indigenous community and expect uh, to be well received or to even get any cooperation. So you, you definitely need to have established uh, working relationships before you start. And you, the um, Canadian, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council does have a particular grant program that is um, to kind of set up the grant. So there is you know, some money attached to that. The university, there's some you know, internal grants, I guess you could apply for to do that as well. But um, mainly drawing on, what I've been doing is, is mainly drawing on either people I know who live in the community, so that's kind of like a secret backdoor <laughs> entry in, or um, yeah, kind of starting well in advance to try and reach out. And, and the other thing we do, is like for the, um, the, the project in Rangan Inlet, we support, w our, our research is really collaborative in that the Rankin Inlet Spousal Abuse Center has its arts-based programs, which we fund, like we <laughs> support them with funding from our project. So, uh, and, and, and then, you know, so they're there re regardless if I'm there. Uh, I come in to, to run a, a workshop, uh, you know, a, a couple of workshops a year, but my collaborator's there all the time running, um, events which which we fund. Uh, two different questions. Uh, I, I'm sort of interested about the transition going to the grocery store. Uh, are, are we seeing more and more families getting away from the traditional diet of the north? Uh, and then the second one is about role models for the young girls. And, and I know that uh, uh, Rankin Inlet, any hockey fans here, they would know that uh, Jordan Tutu, mm -hmm. uh, very much an accomplished uh, professional hockey player, NHLer. Uh, and we've seen since his success a couple of other opportunities. The uh, Aboriginal People's uh, Television Network, they have this... Um, they, they have a, an event now called Game On, and they bring in um, First Nations, uh, Inuit kids, you know, from across the, the country and give them an opportunity to go through a training camp with some high-level coaching. And, and that's sort of, you know, it, it was Jordan's influence there that sort of helped spawn that. Who, are the, who do you see as the role models for these young ladies that, uh, that are coming up? Who are they? Uh, I, I guess that's the question. Um, well, to answer your first question first, um, yeah, the, the, there is hunt, hunting is an ongoing. Uh, people still hunt, you know, the traditional foods and so on. But with climate change happening, it's be, it is becoming a, a concern whether or not how long that will be, you know, possible to do. Um, many of the girls are hunters, um, so w when I, I'm usually there in July, and uh, it's just after caribou hunting season, so they often have little videos uh, to show me of their what you know they're hunting and and their first the caribou that they've caught or, and that kind of thing. So hunting is an issue; it, it does still happen. There's fishing, um, seals, they um, whales, um, so there there is still uh, that very strong. Um, attachment to to the hunting practices and, and and it's it's again it's not just it's definitely not sport it's what they eat so um it's you know very important that feature of the diet there um in terms of the second question girls in Rankin inlet are serious hockey players <laughs> and um uh jordan tutu's influence is all over the place the new arena is named after him um and um there, i think there's a there's not that many roads in Rankin, but one of them is named after him. 
Um, so yeah, his influence is huge. And, and there, recently there have been um, more and more opportunities for youth in the North to become part of sports teams and travel uh, to different places. And in Rankin, um, the girls were, just trying to remember what they were doing, uh, um, gymnastics. They have a very serious and excellent gymnastics team. And when I was there last, they were just coming from a trip to Europe uh, to compete uh, in gym. It wasn't necessarily a competition, but more like an exhibition of, of gymnastics. So there are more and more activities uh, for young people. I think there's been a real, uh, you know, serious attempt to deal with the, you know, the, the epidemic of suicide. And one of the ways in which they've, you know, realized is to have more and more activities for young people um, to keep them engaged and give them a, a kind of goal and purpose. Um, so yeah, so girls and hockey is, is huge um, in Rankin. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thanks for everyone for coming. Yep. Um, very much appreciated. And uh, I, I, I don't know if we can stay for a few minutes. Sure. Just people want to yeah. say hello. Yep. Um, and I'll introduce you to some folks that you might want to know. And sure. then actually, we have to go upstairs and say hello to some people upstairs as well. But, but thank you again. And, uh, thank you. Thank you.